You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBGive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBGive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator and your one-stop source for information on giving and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor, your host, and our guest today is the president and CEO of the California Wellness Foundation, Judy Belk. Judy, thank you for joining me for this second episode. And for all who didn't get a chance to hear the first episode, uh, you'll want to hear it. Let me commend it to you. Um, There we discuss Judy's early life and how she was raised in a home that didn't have plumbing throughout it, and uh, how as a young girl, um, she was actually part of a test case for the historic Brown versus Board of Education decision, which desegregated public schools in the United States. And she's truly, I guess, proof of the adage that it's not where you start that matters, it's where you end up. We also talked about Judy's work at the California Wellness Foundation, the great work going on there to address health disparities and what the foundation is doing today to help people adapt to the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. This episode, Judy, if, if you'll allow me to, I'd like to talk a bit about your writings. I've had a chance to follow you in your writings, through your writings in the LA Times especially. And uh, you write about the social determinants of health and especially gun violence. So first, let me just say that I'm sorry about your cousin who you lost recently. I know that must have been uh, very tragic for your family. But also, I understand that you lost another relative to gun violence. I believe it was your sister. So I'm, I'm, I was really taken when I read that in this L.A. Times piece because it showed how you not only bring the cold data about life expectancy and their disparities between blacks and whites to focus, but you also point out that this is real to you. It's not something that is theoretical. Um, it's, it's affected your life. And I think you do this so well that it makes us all stand up and take notice about these disparities and and what you consider to be these social determinants of health. But it also led to you to think about how to plan financially. I mean, this is something that we had to we have to think differently about when we do our own financial planning at home. Would you talk about that a little bit? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for acknowledging my writing. You know, some folks have, you know, stamp collecting or marathon running for hobbies. I go to a blank page when either uh, something angers me or something makes me laugh or when I need to make meaning out of it. And writing has always been there for me. I, for the last 20 years, I, I've been part of writing groups every other Saturday tomorrow. In fact, I've, you know, tonight I've got to figure out what I'm going to write for my writing group. Tomorrow is a group of accomplished writers and we have a writing coach and we have to bring five pages. And so I write and I've been, I'm always a little astounded to be perfectly honest when someone picks up and publishes and the LA Times has been just a major major boost to my writing. But uh, for the first time, writing is a part of my job. When I was taking this job, the board said, you know, we really hope that you might 
consider using your voice we'd like and using writing and I said wait a minute you want you're gonna you want to pay me now to write and so I um so it, it's in my uh, performance goals that I have to write at least one or two you know pieces a year and so I'm just uh I'm just thrilled at that and it, it also aligns with me wanting again to use all the assets that we have at our disposal, our grant making, our endowment, and our voice to raise issues that we're concerned about. I try to be very authentic in my writing. I'm a really, believe it or not, all right, I'm a very personal person. I don't you know, I don't go around normally sharing a lot, but when I write, I try to be authentic. And so, yes, I have written about about pain. And one of the most painful things in my life was losing my big sister, Vicky. Vicky, the last time I saw Vicky was 41 years ago when she was my maid of honor. When Raj and I traveled back to my hometown church in Alexandria, Virginia, to get married. And she she was murdered. And, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but her death obviously not only impacted me, but my mother and family, but it also impacted the tight-knit Black community in Alexandria. It really did in a in a significant way. But this is, again, where philanthropy really helped me and helped us get through that time. With Vicky's death, all of a sudden, our home church con- contacted the family and saying, people are sending in checks. <laughs> they're just sending in and sending in cash, five dollars, and they're, and, and, no one had asked them or whatever, but people just wanted to do something. Well, folks sent in just so much money that we had enough money and we decided rather than dwell on how Vicky died was the focus on how she lived. And she was a huge, even at a young age, a leader in the church and a real supporter of young People. And so we decided to use those dollars as the beginning of the Vicki Belk Scholarship Fund. That scholarship fund still goes today. It is a nonprofit and folks have continued to support it. And I would say probably about 50 young people have uh, received a Vicki Belk Scholarship to continue their education. How wonderful is that? Something positive coming out of such a horrible experience for you and your family and your community. Judy, this is the story of so many in our society who've lost loved ones. I I heard recently a young man in Philadelphia who had a promising uh, basketball career ahead of him was just gunned down. It's, It's just so sad that we continue to see these stories of people's lives cut short by by gun violence and um I, again I just can only say how how sorry I am for your family having to experience that and as i said you know we know a, a lot about the impact of gun violence not only on loss of life but on trauma my daughter is a former kindergarten teacher and She was teaching um, through her Teach for America service in St. Louis in one of the poorest communities, one of the most unperforming schools in the city. And she was amazed at the number of five-year-olds who shared with her that they had lost someone or they, you know, had seen a gun and she had to go through regular drills with them when they heard gunshots outside the classroom. So we know now the impact gun violence on 
the lives of young folks. We also often forget that there are many folks who, while they might not have lost their lives, they have been permanently disabled. And, you know, the mental trauma, the economic uh, impact. So, you know, it's to us, it's really clear that violence is linked to health and wellness of not only individuals, but to community well-being. And it's a disparity, like so many we see in American society um, that is based on race. And it seems that our nation is beginning to come to grips with both the structural and systemic nature of racism and the disparities that it causes. And I noticed that you wrote very eloquently in a piece about some of your friends and white friends in mm-hmm. particular. And I'll say that uh, in that piece, I noticed that your husband is pleased that he knows so many whites because of you. <laughs> I know. It's, re- it's really interesting. I mean, as you know, you know, in a cynical way, blackness seems to be in and it seems to be in fashion at the moment. And a lot of people are describing their work through a black lens. And I guess I do, while I welcome the increased interest and visibility, both professionally and personally, it's not new, it's not news to me or to you. On the professional side, we've been concerned, again, going back to research and the social determinants of health about Everything from the longevity of, of folks based on race. I mean, you know, if you're if you're African American, you know, your life expectancy is about you know you know ten years less or so than um, the whites and others. I mean, there's a real there's a real life and death issue to your race. You have you know you probably live in communities where the air isn't as clean. You don't have access to jobs, uh, which we're really concerned about because until we have universal health care in this country, whether or not you have access to health care depends on whether or not you have a job or not. So there's some real issues connected to that. I think there's a lot of work to be done, even in the field of philanthropy. We have not stepped up and getting uh, needed resources to underserved communities, to Black communities, Latino communities, and to some parts of the Asian Pacific community. This is an issue we keep talking about, we wring our hands about, but the dial has not moved as much as it should, even as the dollars have increased. So we have some real work to do in the philanthropic side and and really looking at our work in a way that reflects the changing demographics of this country. Well, you know, one of the things I recently wrote about is the lack of diversity on many private foundation boards. There was a study done back in 2017 that indicated of 111 foundations that responded, somewhere near 40% of them continued to have all white boards. And um, I was happy to be able to write about the California Wellness Foundation and its very diverse board as an example of what these foundations can become. And so you should take some credit for being a part of an institution that gets it. But there's so many out there, to finish your point, that don't still get it. They don't understand that it's important to share this power with the people who are in some ways subsidizing your existence through tax exemption. And to create a world that is uh, more equitable and fair is going to involve their role in making some of those decisions. Yeah, I agree with you. And I really appreciate the shout out in your recent article about Cal Wellness. And I would say I can't take credit, but I 
I am in this job. I came to this job because of this foundation's commitment. The credit belongs to Gary Yates, the long-term president and CEO. He recognized that in the early days of forming this foundation, again, looking at the facts, he saw the changing demographics in California and said, well, why don't we try to govern and manage this foundation reflecting the community in which we served? Uh, So he immediately played a role in Cal Wellness having a history of always having a diverse staff. And he made sure that uh, there were diverse faces in the boardroom. So today, the majority of my staff are folks of color. The majority of my board are folks of color, women. And I have to tell you, it makes a difference. This is the most diverse organization that I've ever been in. The facts that have been validated time and time again, that diverse decision-making trumps uh, non-diversity. You make more money, you make better decisions. And it's just one less pressure that I have to worry about trying to explain and be something other than I am when I walk into the door. It does make a difference. Yes, it does. Judy, I just wanted to ask you, as we conclude our interview today, what is your sense of the future? And how do you see young people stepping into this continuum of struggle that we see in our nation, that we've seen in our nation over the years. Do we have a future that is going to be brighter than what we've had in the past? If we do, why, in your opinion? I am optimistic about the future. I am, I know this is a tough, tough, tough time that we are going through, but I think countries and organizations are like individuals that go through tough times. I remember after losing Vicky, I, I didn't think I could ever get out of bed again. But with the support of a lot of folks who literally put their arms around me and the support of Roger and others, I made it through. And I think we'll make it through. And you just hit on one group that I think is going to help us get through, and that is the young people. Uh, I now find myself, for the first time, the oldest person in the foundation. I begged our a few years ago our uh, receptionist not to retire because I knew if she retired, I would be the oldest in the foundation. Well, I am the oldest. And I am just so impressed and I learn every day by not only our staff, but also the young people that are running the foundation, the, the, who, the young people who are running the organizations that we fund. I'm inspired by my own kids to you know, really young adults who could have chosen to do anything with their talents and skills, and they chose a a career of service. I'm inspired by your kids. So I, I'm bullish on a Mary, and sometimes we need a wake-up call, and I think that's what's happening, a wake-up call that that we are going through. But I see opportunities on the other side, maybe going through COVID when so many people who have never, ever lost their jobs, and not only are they losing their jobs, they're losing health care. Maybe on the other side, we can have a conversation about maybe this crazy structure we have of linking Healthcare, access to healthcare to a job. 
that just doesn't make sense. Maybe when folks see the tragedy of the murder of George Floyd, that they can understand why for me and my husband and my son, when they see a police car, they they get nervous. So I think that one, America is rallying around and I believe that we have the tools and we have the will to get through this and we have the information that we need and the resources we need to change the dynamics. We have enough resources that folks can still have their millions and we can also ensure that no child goes to bed hungry. We have the resources to do both. Well, Judy, I can't thank you enough for giving us your time today and and your insights and your experiences and even sharing with us your pain. And I'm also very grateful that you see a reason to be optimistic ahead. And what you've given us today is really the heart of giving. And I want to point that out. And I just wish you continued success with your work at Cal Wellness. You're certainly off to more than a good start, even though you're a young foundation. And as you've expressed the energy and skills and talents of the people in that foundation who will be there long after you're gone, um, I, I just know that we do have much to be optimistic about and that we'll get through this. So, so thank you again very much. Thank you, Art. It's been great to reconnect with you, to be in conversation with you. Stay safe and above all, mask up. Mask up. This is the Heart of Giving podcast powered by BBBgive.org. I hope you'll join us for our next episode. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. Send your comments and ideas to Nona at thusmarket.com. That's Nona at thusmarket.com. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.